and welcome to the Books on Air podcast. I'm Suzanne Harris, and my listeners get the secret story behind every book. Joining me today is a really interesting guy. His name is J.R. Gonzalez, and he's here to talk about his historic horror novel, Esmeralda's Web. J.R. is not only an author, but he's also a musician, and his favorite catchphrase is, Sleep with the lights on and blame me for the nightmares. <laughs> he enjoys scaring people and he likes to make people think about what's important. JR, welcome. Thank you. I'm I couldn't, re- I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist trying to do a scary voice. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, authors start writing for all kinds of reasons. Some people are readers when they're kids and something strikes them and and it makes them think, I want to be a writer. Sometimes a, a kid is in school and a professor or a teacher has them write some kind of assignment and all of a sudden they recognize that there's talent there and they'll encourage the kid. Sometimes there's a life changing event maybe a positive one, maybe a negative one, but it will have an impact on a person so that they feel like they have to share whatever that event is with the world. And so they write, they write a book. Your story about how you actually started writing is rather unique. Would you share that with our listeners? <laughs> um, I I started off writing poems um, to impress people, people would say, write a poem about pizza, and I could do it off just off the cuff. And a few for a band I was in, but mostly for fun. And then I was challenged by someone to, because I was complaining about a book that came out, it waited a long time, and I didn't like the ending. And I said, he starts off great, but he doesn't know how to finish. And everybody started telling me, well, if you can do better, then why don't you? And so I started my very first book, which is called Open Windows. And it's about a woman who is abused by everyone she ever turned to and trusted in her entire life. And one day she snaps. And I promised myself, and I probably need to rewrite that book and then send it out again, but I promised myself that if that book sold a lot of copies, that I would donate money to abused women's shelters and uh, places like that, that they really need, maybe even soup kitchens, where they need help and support because... That's wrong. It, it it bothers me. I've seen that up close and personal, and it bothers me. Wow. So um, from there, I started that first book. Um, a friend of mine pushed me to keep going. Uh, her name is Barb Susky, and I, I'm sorry to say that she passed away. But she worked in a college in Chicago, and one day was sitting having lunch with her friends, and they were talking about their favorite authors, and they were mentioning Tennyson and these really big names and she threw my name in there and they, and my real name is John. So they, John Gonzalez, I've never heard of him. And she looked at them with conviction and said, you will. And that plus the fact that my father kind of edged me towards reading because he was reading a lot, um, pushed me over the edge and made me decide maybe I should look into this. And then I wrote my second book, which is Esmeralda's web. And from what I, I've heard from other people and I would like to say it, but I've heard other people say that I really, I hit it out of the park with that story. Um, It's my most imaginative. uh, I mean, that's what they've said. Most imaginative and creative novel to date. Um, um, My, a friend of mine in publishing, who's becoming my mentor, Maddie Reese, she said it's my flagship and that I should very, be very proud of it. And that that's what I should ride into the next level. Very flattering. How did you get the idea? All books have a story. You know, there's the story that the reader reads from the book, but then there's also a second story. There's a a second story about how the author actually came to write that particular book. Where did the idea for Esmeralda's Web come from, J.R.? I I came up with the idea... One day, I, I I was trying to make a a woman who was truly evil from the start. So at every turn, when she could have done something good, she did. She chose the other path, 
And I, I tried to make her as evil, as powerful as, um, as I could, because she had to survive a lot. Um, and then I, there's touches of my, my real life family in there. The, the character Flacco was, is one of my nephews. And when I told him about it, he was really surprised and honored. And he said, you know, uncle, you wrote about me. (laughs) And I, yeah, but you have to remember that sometimes my characters die in my story. And he looked at me really <laughs> sad. But I'm sorry, Mijo, but at least I made you really cool before I killed you. <laughs> Dear. So a lot of my, my uncle Ray's in there. My mother's in there. My brother Ray. There's a lot of my family is actually in the story. Um, and then there's parts of it that were nightmares that I suffered through that I got up and I put in the story because they were too good to let go. <laughs> and I felt like if I didn't, they were going to keep coming back until I did. What drew you to the horror genre, J.R.? Why horror? When I was, when I was very, very young, it was the only thing that hit me that and John Wayne movies, <laughs> which were all the same. But, um, I liked the, the horror of Frankenstein, the, I thought he was a misunderstood character because he didn't ask to be brought back. He didn't ask to be reassembled the way he was. And, and yet he was, and, um, Dracula, well, Dracula was Dracula. He just had power over everybody. And, but the Wolfman, the same thing. He was, it wasn't something he asked for. It was something he fell into. And I wrote a story about the Wolfman that kind of pays homage, homage to the original story. But it's my story. It's not, it only, I use characters from there like Bella and uh, Baleva, and they give my character a message through the screen when he's watching the movie. And he thinks he can escape by hiding in the bathroom, but he doesn't. They come there too, and nobody else sees him. Nobody else understands him, but it was a dire warning that he should have paid attention to and didn't. Well, he really couldn't because he was a kid. Would you like to share? Movies like that, the. The, the imagination, I mean, they didn't use computers to make the movie scary. They used sound and, and changing light and your imagination. And I like that. That, that. To me, that was more horrifying, more scary than a man with scissors on his fingers or a mask or, you know, a mask that would never die <laughs> as long as people buy the tickets. A little bit more um, visceral, maybe. Is that a good way to say it? Um, a little bit more, yeah, a little bit more uh, of your imagination and not so, not so much blood, though. I mean, good. blood is, it's, it's good to to accent the scene, to make, make people realize how bad it was. But it's not, you don't really need the blood to make the scene scary. You need, you need the person's imagination. You need to grab their brain and, and steer them in a direction. And, and for me, that is really satisfying when I want someone to, to go, oh, my God at the end of a sentence and I'm watching him, they're reading, reading, reading. And at the end of that sentence, they're like, Oh my God. And <laughs> it, it, it's great. It's a great feeling. It's what I wanted and I got it and I knew I would get it. So sometimes, honestly, it, it just, I don't know where that stuff comes from. It's, it's like, it's in space and it comes to my mind and I put it down and then I look at it and think, did I really write that? <laughs> it's called being a creative. It's what, <laughs> that's what that is. Jr. <laughs> Now, you've, you've got a little bit of the Wolfman that you'd like to share with the listener, right? Well, yes, I do. Go. Okay. He should have known better when he saw the full moon, but he denied it. That was his first mistake. He pretended that it couldn't be possible, that it could never come true, that this only happened in movies. He told himself that it was a legend, a myth. The trick of the light or the after effects of eating bad day old pizza and watching too much television. That it was anything but what he knew that it was, what he really was seeing with his own eyes, what he could not deny no matter how hard he tried. Death was walking on the very streets that their children played on, that they used to get to work or whatever they did in the daylight hours. Now there were no sounds of anyone about. The night was deadly silent. At the far end of the lane, the street rose up gradually, and he could see a silhouette that stood out darkly in contrast to the full moon that rose behind him. And in spite of the darkness, he thought he could see the shadow of a man that no longer looked like a man. And even more disturbing, 
From that distance, he couldn't tell for sure, but it seemed to be looking for him, even sniffing in the air in his direction like an animal. Yet he felt that whatever it was, it knew exactly what, where he was at that very moment. But then he told himself, he tried to convince himself that this was just a man after all. Then it changed just a bit, and he almost missed it because it was so slight. He saw the image shift, and because they glowed now, his eyes were blood red as if a light went on behind him, illuminating the way for a man to find him. And he wasn't trying to appear threatening or intimidating at all, but those eyes still glowed a deep red as he stood there, allowing his victim to take in the horror of what was about to happen to him. The reality that there was no escape and that he could not run far enough or fast enough to get away. He never before prayed for anything in his life. He couldn't remember a single prayer, and if he did, he'd never felt the inclination to pray so hard before now. Please, he sobbed once more, looking around for someone to appeal to. But, but please, someone, anyone, make it go away, he shouted. God, please make the sun come up right now. Please, he shouted as he heard the roar of the beast closing in on him. At the very last moment, he opened his eyes and knew that it was real after all and that the reality of that was about to swallow him whole. Wow. <laughs> That's, I'm right there with you on that hill, on that dark street, this poor guy. <laughs> Excellent writing. I mean, you really pull the reader right in with you, Jr. That's Thank you. You know... The the couple a couple of things struck me as we were talking earlier. First of all, you started writing poetry. Now I know that you've been a musician absolutely all your life, and so I think it's a natural thing for you to start writing poetry. And then, were you influenced by any author? Didn't I read that Edgar Allan Poe was an influence for you? Edgar Allan Poe was. Um, I read. Telltale Heart, uh, Mask of the Red Death. Uh, I saw the movies with Vincent Price in them, and it kind of hit home. So Edgar Allan Poe was definitely my earliest and most strong um, inspiration. He, um, I liked the way he drew the reader in, so you smelled the fear and the sweat and that desperation in the men that were like in Telltale Heart, for example. I, I felt his pain and sorrow in Annabelle Lee, which is why I put that book, that poem in the book. Um, so yes, Edgar Allan Poe, H.P. Lovecraft, those are my earliest inspirations. Uh, Stephen King also, he, I liked that I would re be reading his book, which his favorite book by me, for me was, uh, Ghost Story. I mean, I'm sorry, Salem's Lot. Um, and I can't remember the other one now, but, oh, The Stand, I'm sorry. But he made me feel like when I was a very young kid, I had a nightmare and he was there because when he wrote his books, it was like, where were you when I, when, I mean, I saw this. I, I it was like relating something that I had gone through from a different angle, of course, because this was his imagination. But it was, it was so easy to relate to. I love that about his work, work. You know, it's so interesting to always hear who has inspired an author because authors do inspire others. And I, I think it's a real compliment to them what you've just said about their work. Now, let's talk about Esmeralda's Web. Let's give our listeners an overview of what the book is about, because it's a horror book, but there's also some time travel in there. It's a really interesting plot. It, um, it spans about a 200-year period. It, it involves a witch named Esmeralda that I tried from the very start to make her as evil as possible because of the things that she has to go through and do. Um, in the background, there's two high school kids who fall in love and share an innocent kiss. And even as they do that, they realize deep inside that it's going to be their first and only kiss, that after this, it's going to get really bad. And then it does. Um, she's burned at the stake as a witch, even though the preferred method for dealing with a witch at the time was hanging. And he's boiled in acid. And, you know, you think that's the end of the story, but... Uh, right after that, the two people that were most responsible for that die in a similar fashion. She rips his throat out, and then she dies in a fire. 200 years later, our protagonists are back in high school in K-12. 
California because most of my stories have relate to California because that's where I grew up. And um, the two antagonists are there as well, but unaware of each other's presence and unaware of why they're there or who they're actually chasing, which is the, the two hero, the hero and the heroine. Uh, so it's kind of a love story. It's kind of a personal story in that there's a lot of my real life in there. But I, I wanted to make a horror story that was different than anything else. Uh, I, I like the story, the idea of reincarnation. I try to explain it, the pros and cons of the church, why they believed in it, why they don't like it. But um, it was a lot of, uh, it was a lot of fun. You know, it was like work that's fun. Sort of like my job. It's, um, <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, Esmeralda is an evil witch who accuses Elizabeth of being a witch, gives, um, commits, accuses her of all her own crimes until she's burned alive. Um, the, they, uh, when they come back in, and in modern times, they're more, uh, it's more like what I didn't went through in high school, the backyard parties where they had a live band and stuff. The, that kind of stuff really happened in my life. But they're trying to find out about reincarnation, and they kind of stumble across across this this uh, psychologist uh, research technician that has written books about reincar reincarnation and wants to include their experiences in her study. And that's how all four get connected again, and in the ending. Very clever. Very clever plot stroke. Yeah, I like that a lot. Now, I'm sure our listeners are saying, okay, okay, you've got us. Where can we find these books? So let me tell you about Amazon. All of JR's books are on Amazon. We're specifically talking about Esmeralda's Web today. So if you go to Amazon, there's a big search feature at the very top of their page, and all you do is type in the words Esmeralda's Web, and let me spell that for you, E S M E R. A L D A apostrophe S and then Web W E B by J R Gonzalez G O N Z A L E Z. Click on it and the book will come right up and you'll see in the upper right hand corner of the representation of the cover two words. It says look inside. If you'll click on those two words, the book opens, not literally, electronically, of course, and you're able to read a little excerpt of the book. You can buy it right there. Now, you had some things that you wanted to tell the listeners about Amazon for you, right, JR? Yes, I did. Um, there's, actually, there's another thing that I forgot to mention when we were talking previously, but the copy of Esmeralda's Web on both my website and Amazon, the green copy is a very good copy, but please don't buy it. But the reason for that is that the company that put that book out took all my money and they've given me nothing. I, I don't have any, I was supposed to have a really nice copy of that book, as you can tell by the cover. And if you look inside, there's a lot of really good content in there. But if you, if, I'm trying to have it republished right now through Maddie Reese. But if you can't wait for that version, which probably will be around maybe Christmas, um, go to the Ex Libris copy. It's the one with the blue writing on it. And that is actually the most complete version that you can buy right now um, until this new one comes out. Oh, good. That's Thank you for telling them that. Now, there is... You're welcome. A, they can rank you. There's a, a ranking system on Amazon that I think you wanted to mention as well. Oh, yes. Um, I'm sorry. I wanted, When I talk to people and... Honestly, if you're in an elevator with me, a shopping line, um, you're waiting for the bus, and I'm standing there, if you're a prisoner of that space for five minutes, I'm going to talk to you about my book. <laughs> I'm going to give you my card. I'm going to tell you to spread the word. Um, but I, when I talk to people and I tell them, you can get my books at Amazon because it's the most well-known and reliable source to get something like that. But I also ask them, when you get it, you know, we run into each other again. I'd be happy to sign it. But what I would like you to do is to give me stars when you read it. So because they pay, they pay attention to those things. They, it helps me. And they always say they will. So 
I like Amazon. I think that's a good thing. I also for, like my, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think that's a good thing for you to mention because I think often people don't know that. And they don't know that there's any way to do that. And so I'm glad you're saying that, Jr. because I think that's important for an author for the very reason you just said. Yes, thank you. Now, you have got a stunning website. Let's tell our listeners where they can find your website. It's the www.jonr. G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-Z-B-O-O-K-S dot com. Um, John R. Gonzalez Books dot com. It will take you directly to my website where you can also order the book. You can click on a drop down link there and it will show you what each book is about before you order it. There's a gallery that covers some events that I've done, things that I, I, I like to have fun wherever I go. There's... There's pictures in there of a movie theater where I went to watch Star Wars and a guy showed up with lasers and uh, laser sabers and costume. And I got into it, with, not got into it with him like an altercation, but I, him and I were playing and a little kid was with us that came out of the audience. So I really, really like to have fun when I go. I, I'm hard to ignore. And the gallery will probably show that. But there's also ways to contact me to leave me a message. And uh, if you go there, please do sign in and let me know. I, I, I appreciate knowing people come by and spend the time there. The website is just super. I mean, whoever did this for you did such a great job. It's so it's attractive. It's interactive. The gallery is very cool. The way the the books, there's there's one book that sort of jiggles and wiggles, and I was just so taken in by the website. I thought, this is really terrific. This is the way this ought to look. Now, you're also doing some other social media. You're on Facebook. Let's tell them how to find you on Facebook. There's, I believe there's three ways. It's either B-L-U-E-Z, man, uh, Ray Gonzalez, or um, Facebook, me at bluescornernews.com, I believe. And then I believe those three ways will take you to Facebook. Uh, Ray Gonzalez and Bluesman on Instagram. Good. And on Twitter, Ray Gonzalez as well. Excellent. I think Ray Gonzalez 265. Excellent. Now, our time is running out, JR. So I have one more question for you. I always like to give the author the last word about their book. And Esmeralda's Web is such an interesting book. It's one of those things that when our listeners become readers and they pick up a copy of Esmeralda's Web, they're going to read, want to read it in the daytime. Because if, if they read it at night, they're going to feel <laughs> things breathing over their shoulders. Do you want them, when they finish the book, when they close that back cover, either electronically or physically for the last time, do you just want them to feel like they've read a great story? Or is there something else you want them to take away from the book? I, When I first started writing, um, a well-meaning friend gave me some really good advice. Uh, he told me, if you're writing to make money, you're doing it wrong. And so I don't, I've never been one to want to gouge my readers with a high priced book or, you know, buy this book and buy this book or buy this book. I, I like to, I like them to be entertained. I like them to feel like they got away from the virus and the scares that are out there for a little while. But I also want them to have fun. I want them to remember it's, you know, it's, it's a story. I want, I love that they, they want to turn the page to find out what's next. Um, that's, they're a reader. I mean, a writer, excuse me. You want to hear people gasp at the right moment. And sometimes you can watch somebody reading your book and they gasp and you know where they are just because of the way they, <laughs> they reacted. So, and that's what I want my readers to have to, to take from this, to, to have some fun, to escape for a little while, to want to read another book if mine or anyone else, because I think it's important to read. I, I encourage people to read. I encourage people to write. I tell people when they say, I have a story to write, I mean, I mean I have one of, I've always wanted to write a book. And I tell them, why don't you? And they, oh, I don't have the time or I don't have, who's going to want to read my book? And I made the same excuses, but I can give a perfect example. I told them, 
You have a story to tell. And if you don't tell it, eventually someone else will. So who do you want to tell your story? And my perfect example is I worked on a book for about six, six years, seven years. Almost every day, um, I thought it was original. I thought it was something that no one else had thought of. And then I threw it away when Jeepers Creepers came out because it was the same idea. <laughs> Not exactly the same way, but it was enough, close enough that someone would say, oh, you saw Jeepers Creepers and wrote this. So tell your story. Get out there and do it. I love it that you're giving would-be authors that advice, Jr. I think that's so valuable. You have done it. Thank you. You've written your books. This has been so much fun. I've enjoyed meeting you, talking to you, and hearing about your books. I hope that our listeners will pick up a copy if they want to be scared to death. And what is it that <laughs> what is it that you like to say? What's your sign off? Your favorite line? Sleep with the lights on. <laughs> And blame me for the nightmare. I love it. Thank you so much for being our guest on Books on Air. And remember, you can find Esmeralda's Web, and that's E-S-M-E-R-A-L-D-A apostrophe S, Esmeralda's Web, by J.R. Gonzalez, G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-Z, with a Z, not an S, on Amazon. <laughs> You Thank been, you. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. You've been listening to the Books on Air podcast brought to you on webtalkradio.net. You can also hear this podcast on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts. I'm Suzanne Harris, and I hope you'll join us for the next Books on Air podcast because, remember, you never know who's going to be here, and you never know what we're going to talk about. Thank you so much for listening.